she took pen in hand and wrote this very mature letter for an 11 year old girl um, suggesting that Abraham Lincoln grow whiskers because the whiskers would hide the uh, long shallow face. Three days later Abraham Lincoln replied to her. He did grow the beard, won the election and um, came to see her in her little town on the way to Washington. We call it the little girl who changed the face of a nation. What this is, is this is getting into positions, getting into companies undetected by radar. You might call it stealth. Today, how an 11-year-old girl influenced Abraham Lincoln and helped change the course of history. Eric Burdett, the director of the short film Grace Bedell is here. And later, career guide Daryl Gurney tells you how to sneak in the back door of your dream job. Up first, Eric Burdett. Pleasure to have you here today, Eric. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So this is a fascinating story, and I actually didn't realize, but it is based on a, a true story of this 11-year-old girl who wrote to Abraham Lincoln. It is. It's an amazing story of an 11-year-old girl who um, was so far beyond her years, and she was anti-slavery in a time when that was not cool. You know, it was not cool to be anti-slavery, and here's an 11-year-old girl who put it all on the line for Abraham Lincoln. And um, she was a big fan of Abraham Lincoln, and her father was a big fan of Abraham Lincoln, and their family was divided. But the girl had never seen Abraham Lincoln, but she just knew this was her idol, and he was anti-slavery, and she wanted him to win, you know, to become president. In the day before CNN? And in, the, in the day before <laughs> CNN and Gregory Mantel. That's right. So um, what she did was she finally saw a picture of Abraham Lincoln that her father brought her from the fair, and she had a conniption fit. This was not the man she thought would be leader of uh, the United States. She saw Justin Timberlake in her mind and, and there was the picture and it wasn't. You know? She couldn't, she had no idea what to do, you know, because the pop idols at that time weren't the same. And uh, so what she did was she got really upset because uh, he had a long, daunting face. And she took pen in hand and wrote this very mature letter for an 11 year old girl um, suggesting that she, uh, that Abraham Lincoln grow whiskers because the whiskers would hide the uh, long shallow face and um, three days later Abraham Lincoln replied to her wow. which wow. is unheard of you yeah. know I mean to, to write to a little girl and he was uh, he, he was very taken by the letter and he said I don't know if I'm gonna do this wouldn't it just be a, a silly affectation is what he called it in his letter that he wrote to her and uh, we don't know what happened but we do know what happened because he did grow the beard, won the election, and um, came to see her in her little town on the way to Washington. Wow. So, I mean, this little girl, as I said in the intro, I think in a way probably helped influence the course of history in the sense that, you know, especially these days where everything is so visual with TV, uh, you know, but even then, I mean, okay, they didn't have TV, but, but somebody's impression, you know, when you see them in the big speech or something, you know, the, just the fact that that aesthetic kind of, yeah. you know, the, the makeover. Right. Uh, it is certainly not today, you know, I mean, it was at a time when, um, you know, like we just said, there's no cable shows, there's no, there's no news, and the only print you have are posters and newspapers. Mm. And, you know, to see this, this, this Abraham Lincoln, you know, change his whole demeanor, he change his whole look, uh, according to this young girl. I mean, we, we call it the little girl who changed the face of a nation. Wow. You know, that's our catchphrase. And, and it's true, because God only knows what would have happened if he didn't win. And so then she went on to a career in politics and became an in image handler for future generations of American presidents, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. She became, the, she became the power broker for all major presidents, <laughs> advised them of the look and uh, how they should talk. But no, it, it's just, it's a great story. And um, my partner, my producing partner, Mark Esslinger, has a daughter, who Lana Esslinger, who we wrote this for. Yes. He. I was going to tease you. I can't tease you because it's not your daughter. But I was going <laughs> to tease him because the, the daughter ended up in the film. So. Yeah, uh, of course, of course. We actually this whole film was designed for her. We were um, making short films for fun, and um, one day my partner, Mark Esslinger, was. Uh, accompanied his daughter to school where a lady had just wrote a, written a book about Abraham Lincoln and Grace Bedell. And he, he started thinking, and it, you know, she's nine years old, Grace Bedell was 11 years old, why don't we make this movie? So he calls me on the way home very excited. He's like, uh, Grace Bedell, Grace Bedell, Lincoln, Whiskers. Eh. And uh, he said, we got to make this movie. And I said, it's a period piece. And I said, this isn't the little short film we've been shooting in the backyard. This is a major production. And That's uh, always kind of, that's not usually said enthusiastically in Hollywood in general anyway, right? Period no. piece, it's kind of like, no. oh, it's a period piece. It's a period piece. <laughs> and, uh, 
I mean, it required costumes. And you know, I started thinking all this, how am I gonna pull this off? This is not, this is not cheap. Mm -hmm. So you know, we, I decided to produce it too, because I'm a control freak. Mm -hmm. And I need to you, you know, be in charge of every aspect of the film. And I decided if we're making a period piece, I don't want to do a boring historical short. You know, I want this to be, I don't want it to have that sepia look, that old black and white look. I want to do this with, with vibrant colors and um, you know, great sets and bring this to life. Yeah. So do it exactly opposite what you think of for a short film about a period piece. Give it, you know, great colors, give it a great look, give it great camera angles, and uh, I think we achieved that. Well, you know, the thing that really st st uh, stuck out to me too when I was watching it was just the music. Oh. I was really impressed by the music. Oh, Gregory, it was, uh, I, I wanted a John Williams score. I mean, I think big when I do these things, and I, I said, it's got to be sweeping, it's got to be John Williams-like, and people were laughing at me. They're, How are you going to get a John Williams score with, you know, $500 that you have allotted for the music? <laughs> so I went to Craigslist, the ultimate, you know, the ultimate uh, low-budget filmmaking place. Place and I placed an ad. There's a few other things too, but that's another show for Yeah, I've gotten day. late from Craigslist. <laughs> now the interview is getting good. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much you can do on Craigslist. You can make a movie, you can have sex, you can, uh, you can get stalked, but literally. Yeah, you could also make a movie about. Uh, you could, you, know. you could. I should have. But um, no, very exciting is I posted an ad and I said, I have $500. I want a John Williams score. And everybody laughed at me. You know, people are like, right, wrote back, are you. Are you kidding? You know, you, you can't do this. Luckily, I found a guy named Ben Goldberg in New York who uh, submitted a sample score. Blew me away. Blew me and my Mark Essinger away. And we said, we gotta have this guy. And I said, listen, I, I'm different than most people. I want to score under every scene of this movie. Mm -hmm. So that's 17 minutes of mo music. And he agreed to do it. And uh, thank you for recognizing that because it's, to me, I still get the goosebumps when I hear this score. Well, and, and the reason too, I think it especially stood out to me, although I think I would have just, you know, because you just hear it, but I was reading a book about sound and the one thing the guy says is like, don't skimp on your music. And mm -hmm. he said, that's one thing that kills like independent projects, as yeah. you know. And, and he was right. I mean, when you hear the fact that you had this big, it sounded like a big movie, just thank you. in large part because of that score. It did, it, it brought so. this whole thing to life. I mean, the, the opening scene, I wish they could see it. I uh, always envisioned this amazing scene with the little girl in the field and she's twirling a, a ribbon and she's the epitome of free and this is freedom she's in a beautiful hey, that's little house on the prairie a little bit a little, a little influence from a little house on the prairie but I don't have her rolling down a hill yeah. I've got her running across the field but a lot of people have said that so thank you um, anyway so I got this dream field I found this dream field that I couldn't even imagine better and um, she's reciting you know Lincoln's you know, a house divided th that speech, and she's speaking of slavery and how the nation's going to crumble if it doesn't, if it doesn't uh, coalesce on slavery and freedom. And she, you know, she's out there, freedom, and it was it was poetry to me. And to have this score behind it really just gave an uplifting goosebump moment. Well, it was very well done, and it, and it was interesting, as you said as well too. It was very bright colors and just had a very interesting visual look as well. So. Instead of some stodgy, you know, exactly. period piece. Of exactly. Time. I'm very proud of it, and uh, we've been winning a lot of festivals. Um, the festival circuit is uh, something I just I'm not a big fan of. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, we got rejected from one festival, the Washington D.C. Shorts Festival, and they you're lucky enough to get their critique to find out why you didn't win. One of the critiques was uh, I have two actors in the film that have accents. You know, and one of their critiques was the accents were awful. Now let me explain something. The accents were from a Russian guy who's Russian, and he had a Russian accent. He's really Russian, and they're <laughs> saying he had a bad accent. Uh, so I, okay, we're going to critique them now. <laughs> let's critique them. My partner fired off a letter to them saying uh, some great things to them that I wish I could have said too. So <laughs> a few new Russian words, I'm a sure. A few new Russian <laughs> words, possible. We'll be right back. And we are back with Eric Burdett about the movie Grace Bedell, the Lincoln short film. Wait a minute. So I thought I was here for the physical fitness segment. 
<laughs> I was going to take yeah, my shirt off. Yeah, you're the talk. trainer, right? I'm you're the, the trainer. From, oh my God, I apologize. I, I was going to teach everybody how to gain thing. weight. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a choice I am, project. Yeah, it's, it's, that's my project. <laughs> yes. No. Thank you very much for having me here again. It's a pleasure to be here and on the sure. Gregory Mantel show. Uh, you've had over 300 episodes, which is uh, you know I'm very honored to be here. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, we're we're cranking them out. Good. But um, but you know I think you've kind of hit on something with this too. I don't know whether it was intentional, but. Uh, Lincoln right now, you know, there, there's that whole like Lincoln vampire <laughs> thing is coming out. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, but, you know, no. There's, yeah, the, the, the guy who did um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies wrote a book called um, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Oh, wow. And, but so he's the best-selling author. They still, you know, it was, I think they're making it into a movie too, is <laughs> from what I hear. So whether or not you know this, there's actually going to be a whole renewed interest. Wow. I mean, just despite his obvious major historical interest as it is, but, yeah. but he's actually going twilightish. Now. Oh, that's fantastic. So he's cool. Okay. He is cool. Well, you know, when we, uh, <laughs> speaking of the Lincoln thing, the popularity, the Obama campaign was very into this, and we tried to get the actual letter that uh, Lincoln wrote to Grace Bedell and the letter that Grace Bedell wrote to him, and um, we found out that the Obama campaign was looking for that too. They were very into this, so. Really? Yeah. So into your project or just into the letter? I, I wish into the project, <laughs> just into the letter. But uh, we, we've made several attempts to get it to them, but I, uh, you know. Stimulus is more important. Ah, uh, well, I guess he. Well, he did spend time in Illinois, so he's just a fan of Lincoln. Is yeah, that he's a big he fan is? of Lincoln. Well, yeah, and it's it's something I don't ever remember hearing growing up. I mean, I don't think I've most heard people it. know this. No, and that's what's so exciting about it. Uh, we just won the most original film, uh, most original short film, the Columbia Gorge Festival, because again, nobody's heard of this story, and to come up with something. And, and this was the Smart Festival that accepted you. Instead <laughs> it of was saying one that of the smart. It was one of the few. Yes, yeah. yes, it was one of the few <laughs> smart ones. But. Uh, y y you know, it was great. The other day, uh, Aaron Sorkin, who's one of my heroes, hmm. uh, West Wing, Few Good Men, Charlie Wilson's War, and the upcoming Social Network, wrote, you know, he wrote that. He saw this movie and uh, was just really impressed with it. And he gave me a quote for uh, publicity that says, Eric Burdett, or Grace Bedell demonstrates that Eric Burdett is an exciting new filmmaker. Uh -huh. And I got tears in my eyes. It was to hear from one of your idols, you know, a compliment and oh, validation. Sure. It, was, sure. it, oh, it, was, it was, thank you, Aaron Sorkin. Now, what's your plan for this? Um, are, do you want to keep it as short to get it on the festival circuit? Do you want to have it remade into a major motion picture? You know, what, what, what's your vision for this? I would love to make this into a motion picture. I just don't know if there's enough subject matter. I mean, it's basically the letter and him coming to visit her. So these days they make it into a reality TV show. A reality TV show would be fantastic. <laughs> Lincoln and Grace on the road together, you know. Um, but no, no, it would be great to make this into a feature. Right now, we're doing this short, the um, film festival circuit, and we have our big premiere coming up on uh, at the Burbank International Film Festival on Wednesday night. So you are getting around on the circuit. Now, what, what happened to her later in life when I was joking about her career in politics, but did she ever, was, was that her? That was it. That was the limelight. That was the she peaked song. at 11. She peaked she at 11. Well. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, no, she just went on to an ordinary life. She married a Union soldier or something? Is That's that what I heard. I think, yeah. Yes. Then, okay. And I guess back then she probably didn't have a career of her own or? I don't think so. Okay. I re you know, my, my producing partner, Mark Eslinger, is the historian. And did he do meticulous research oh, as far as? For sure. He, uh, he's a consummate professional and uh, he did a lot of research on this, much more than I, I did. You know, I'm more into the filmmaking and taking his words and making them into, uh, you know, reality. But uh, yeah, he did a lot of research. And now, what was it like making this? Because again, it was a short film on a tight budget. I mean, what was your shooting schedule? And, it was you know? tight. And you know, I aspire to grand things. And I think if you look at this, you don't look at it as a small, low budget film. It was hard. It, I had to get a great crew. Um, again, like I said, I produced it. So I was running, wearing two hats. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily, uh, Mark put up half the money and I put up half the money and we, um, brought this thing to life and where it really came to life for me was the post-production aspect mm -hmm. because if you notice in the film every scene has what I call an Eric Burdett signature the scene where she's in the stream reading the letter that Abraham Lincoln wrote I decided it needs something so I put a butterfly in that uh -huh. just suddenly uh -huh. passes by her and uh, every scene had something like that I, this was my first film that I got to do with visual effects and I found a great guy Andrew Lewitton who did all my visual effects for me and uh, you know we had to recreate um, when Lincoln came to visit her
um, in Westfield, we had to create a train station from the 1860s with, there were probably several thousand people there. I had five extras. <laughs> so we turned the five extras into several thousand people. I had a great guy named Steven Tyler build me a train um, out of animation, CGI train. Of course, I can't do anything simple. I wanted a train to come through the shot, you know, and to get a train to look real on a low budget of what I paid him. It's very difficult, but I think it came off pretty good. Yeah, and the, well, the other thing too. I mean, it has almost a musical kind of feel to it. Yeah. I mean, it, you were you were trying to make it into I mean, as vibrant as possible. Of you know, I mean, I just I, I think it, it, yeah, yes. And um, we're running out of time here, but I just want to ask you, um, as far as the the young Grace Bedell or uh, Lana Lana Aslinger, Aslinger. Um, is she does she have the acting bug now? Or oh, she... she's got the acting bug. I mean, the, I know we got a few seconds here, but the letter that Lincoln wrote or the the link the the letter that Grace Bedell wrote to Abraham Lincoln. Usually in a movie, you'd see her at the desk writing and you'd hear a voiceover of her. And I said, I, I, I want to do something completely different. I want you to memorize the speech. I want you to memorize this letter. And we did a steady cam shot that lasted a minute of her reciting, speaking to Abraham Lincoln as if he was the camera. And uh, something rarely done and for a nine-year-old girl to uh, nail that was something I'm very proud of. Oh, so she is still nine. But she's, I think she's 10 now. A 10, okay. And she's going on to bigger and better things. Well, thank you very much, Eric Burdett. Much success to you, too. And bigger and better things with the film Grace Bedell. Thank we'll be you right, so much. We'll, we'll be right back. <laughs>And we are back. Joining me now is Daryl Gurney, the career guy. His book is The Backdoor Job Search. Great to have you back again today, Daryl. Good to be back. Thanks, Greg. So last time you were here, you were telling us a bit about sneaking in the back door at a job, which I like the idea of sneaking in the back door because... Yeah, um, I, actually sneaking, I try not to say sneaking because then people think they're doing something wrong. Oh, this okay. is actually just playing off of human nature. And so what this is, is this is getting into positions, getting into companies undetected by radar. You might mm. call it stealth. So that's stealth. a little bit. Okay, yeah. stealth. I yeah. like the stealth approach. Yeah, yeah. And I know, you, so you've got it, I just thought today we kind of drilled down into it in more detail for people who want to put Absolutely. this into action, their stealth program. Yeah. Um, you, so you have 10 principles for doing this, sure. or 10 steps. Sure, and again, just to, to, to reiterate what we spoke about last time, this is about, in today's market or any in any job market, 98% of people try to get their jobs through applying for jobs. Sure. So this ebook and it's going to be a printed book soon is called backdoor job search never apply for a job again because it's about how to avoid the throngs and not be one of the 10,000 trying to come through the front door right because just most of those positions are probably filled by the time they get listed anyway or right or you're one of 10,000 how are you going to stand out from the crowd right and so what this is about this is about the uh, changing psychology a little bit this is about tapping into well in Hollywood uh, given you, you know this probably but it's all who you know sure it's all you Absolutely. know and everybody knows that but rarely do people ever put that to effect or to work in their career in their job change mm. people a lot of times when they're out of a job they go into a looking online to some of the big uh, job sites look to see what's available what's open and they start applying for it and they're one of 10,000 what this is about though this is about connecting with people in relationships through what I call the back door so that you're known and so that you can hear about things before the masses hear about them. Hmm. Yeah. And this can be when you already have a job or when you're looking for a job or really just any time? Yeah, it's really all the time actually because you always want to have a career tribe. You always want to have people out there that know what you're up to. The reason is is because most people think of themselves as employees. Mm. And so when they're in a job, they think, okay, well, I have my job. And they don't think beyond that. But the truth is is that everybody owns their own business. I tell this to clients all the time. You own your own business. You just choose to lease your employable assets out to a particular employer. I like that way of thinking about it. Yeah, because it makes you always think about what's the return I'm getting on my employable assets. Yep. And so the idea is, is that even if you're working, even if you're happy, Keep connected with people who know about you and know what you're good at and know what you want because you may hear of your next opportunity long before you're tired of the one that you're in. Hmm. And so you even give examples of what, like letters and things that you send out to people, but how would somebody get started in doing this, um, a research project, you know, to connect with people, yeah. I think is how you... 
Well, the first thing is to realize that uh, the worst thing you can do if you need a job is go out and ask for a job. Mm. Okay, so principle number one is the best way to get a job is don't be looking for one. Mm. Now, that's not to say you don't need to meet people. You need to meet a lot of people everywhere. But don't meet them out of your need for a job because that repels people. Right. Because, see, people want to win. They don't want to lose. And so if somebody comes to you and needs something that you may not be able to give them, they're going to shy away from that meeting. Mm. However, principle number two says... Uh, an ounce of research is worth a pound of job search. Mm -hmm. So in other words, go out in the areas that you're passionate about. Talk to people about things that really interest you. And grow a network of people who are aware of what you're interested in, what you want to know more about. And then what happens is you become top of mind. Mm -hmm. And by becoming top of mind, there's always going to be opportunities filtering in. So instead of calling up and saying, hey, got any jobs, or can you, can you give me a job? Right. You call and say, so I hear you're an, ex or you're, you're an expert in, uh, you kind of schmooze them a little, or how does this work? Well, yeah, exactly. Well, let me, let me tell you a success story of how this actually works sure. to kind of describe it. One of my clients, one time she was a VP of marketing for PacBell, big telecommunications company. Sure. She uh, knew she needed to get out of that. She thought her only option was to be another marketing VP at another telecom company. Mm -hmm. So what we did was, uh, I said, not necessarily, and uh, that's the myopic thinking that most people have. But what we did, we took her in, we did some career inventory work, we got her really aware of her unique value and what she brings to situations. We did some personal branding with her, mm -hmm. and then I taught her this backdoor method, which is what I describe in the book. Through the backdoor method, she was out talking to people about things she was really passionate about. Now, it turns out, though she was a VP of marketing, it wasn't like the first thing that she talked about in terms of her passion. She was Jewish, very, very into her culture. Mm -hmm. Always wanted to do something in her culture, but it never, you know, she was making big corporate money. Through the back door, through meeting people in areas of passion, she ended up becoming the executive director of a nonprofit organization that trains bomb sniffing dogs for Israel. Wow. <laughs> a little bit of a transition yeah. from uh, yeah. Bell. <laughs> exactly. And the thing about that is that could have never happened through the front door. Because see, through the front door, she would have needed to have certain experience, certain background, having worked with nonprofits at certain levels. But through the through the back door, she met people, and people could just connect with her based on their relationship, and they could say, you know, you'd be really good for that. You know, I'm going to connect you with somebody. Okay, because, yeah, and I wonder just maybe you could tell me more about how you do follow up afterward, because so you meet the people, and then how do you close the deal or get the job or get the referral to the job? Sure, or, sure. You know, do you, and how much? You know, do you call every day or once a week? Or anyway, how do you follow up? Well, uh, I, I guess I need to answer your first question first, which is how do you even approach them? Hmm. So how you approach them is you don't approach them for a job, you send them a note. You find the people that are into what you're interested in. And you send them a note not saying, hey, I'm looking for a job, could I sit down, I'd love to talk with you about how it could be valuable to your company, right? But rather you write them a note that actually says the opposite. It says, by the way, I'm not looking for a job. Now this is not a trick though, mm. and this is what I really emphasize in the book. A lot of people think, oh, it's a trick, you're trying to get in and say you don't want a job. Here's what you really need, is you need information. Mm. Everybody needs more information when they make a career transition. Mm. Okay, I'll just ask you a question, Greg. Do you have any friends who went to law school who never practiced law? Yes. Yeah, a lot of people do. So these people invested a lot of time and a lot of money into something they didn't end up moving on, maybe because they didn't have enough information up front. Mm. Same thing with careers. I tell people, Make sure you really know all the ins and outs about something before you make a decision. Uh -huh. So what I tell people to do is <clears throat> contact people and even put in the letter a disclaimer, please be aware I don't expect you to know of a position or to have one. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking for information. I'm particularly interested in this area. I love what's going on in this aspect of the industry or that aspect of the industry. And because of your unique position, I'd love to sit down if you could give me five to ten minutes and get some more information about that. And that kind of takes the pressure off of feeling that you, you know, oh, they just want a job. Absolutely. Because when a letter comes in that basically says I need a job, it goes to HR. Sure. Right? If a letter comes in that appeals to you, like if I, if, take for example, uh, internet and cable uh, television show. Dear Greg, I'm writing to you because your experience in the internet and, 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 and cable television programming arena, you really seem to have a great success track record in that area. You're I, hired. 
<laughs> I frankly don't know much about that area, but because of your experience, I thought you could give me some vital information. I'm looking to do something in that area myself. Please be aware, I don't expect you to know of a position or to have one, but if you could give me five minutes of your time, that would be wonderful. I'll give your office a call in the next week to see if I could set up a time. See, the tendency is that people want to help people. I, I believe underneath it all, we all want to help people. It's just that there's barriers to helping people. Number one, time. If I ask you for an hour, you don't have an hour. You're flying out tomorrow. <laughs> if, I ask you, if I ask you for a job, you may not have a job. But if I ask you for five minutes of your advice, guess what? You might be willing to give me that. And I'm sorry, on the time note, we are running out of time, but in our final minute, um, so how, how do you follow up then once you've made the initial contact? So when, when you follow up, basically you got to get on the phone because you, you're busy, you're running around, so I may have to call you, you know, once a week for, for several weeks until I get a hold of you. You may want to handle it on the phone, but if I'm doing the backdoor job search correctly, I'm going to say, you know what, Greg, it would just be so great if I could just meet you five minutes somewhere because I really get a lot out of being in the environments because I want to meet with you. And when you meet with me, when you start to like me and I stay in touch with you on a monthly basis on my research, you tend to think about me. And guess what? When something comes up or you hear of an opportunity for a career guy to get his own show, you're going to let me know. Great idea. <laughs> Thank you very much, Daryl Gurney. The book is Backdoor Job Search. Get out there and get looking. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll talk. Or actually, don't, don't look. Uh, meet. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. Take care. Bye.